Okay, I think we're ready. We're going to get started. I can't believe you guys have staying power. Do you realize what the weather's like out there? And it's four o'clock, and you've spent how much of your day in the exhibit hall? Aren't your heads ready to explode by now? And we're going to talk measurements for seating. Whew. Dedicated attendees. My name is Stephanie Lawrence. I'm an occupational therapist. I'm from Canada. And guess what? We measure in inches, not centimeters up there. I'm sorry for the Europeans. I don't mean to insult you. So I am an occupational therapist, full disclosure. I work for a company called Motion. We're a dealer, we sell equipment. I've worked for them for 18 years, but I've actually been working, well, I've been working in the industry for 35, four and a half months to retirement. <laughs> But I've also been working with people with disabilities and special needs for 42 years. I am, my official title is a clinical educator for our company across Canada. On the other hand, I'm also known as the equipment geek, the commode queen, the custom seating lady, normally the lady with the really short hair, the one with the opinion. And as I said, I'm so, so close to retirement I'm old, I'm gray, I don't give a damn anymore. I will be giving you my opinion, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I came across this quote, 80 to 90% of wheelchair users are in a chair that doesn't fit their body. Wow. I had to sit back and take a look when I read it, and then search to see where exactly that quote came from. Now, I want to believe that because it came from a wound care source, that it was through the lens of somebody who is seeing wounds, and they're not seeing all our perfectly well-seated people, right? But it made me think, if that many users are in chairs that don't fit their bodies, did they suddenly all gain weight? Did they all lose weight? What happened? Or was there an issue way back when the piece of equipment was prescribed? And that pretty much really starts the discussion that says size really matters in wheelchairs. By the end of this session, if you stay to the end, by the end of this session, you should be able to, number one, describe the basic client measurements for seating in wheelchairs. And this should be new, not new information for you. Identify common barriers for getting accurate measurements. And more importantly, the crux of what I want you to take away from this session is relate how the measurements and function create prescription parameters. Because that is probably more important than anything else. Size matters and our measurements matter, but really, it's how they get put through that black box of function of what comes out of the other end that determines what the prescription is. Before even pulling out the piece of paper and figuring out who you're going to do it and where you're going to do it, is taking a look and making a plan about how you're actually going to achieve the purpose of getting the correct measurements. Number one, what are you measuring for? Some people, and I will tell you, I'm a resource to our sales reps across the country. And I worked with a lot of sales reps and they go, well, I'm only measuring for a cushion. So I really only need, you know, width and depth. I go, really? That client's never going to need a shower commode chair. That child's never going to need a bath seat. Really? Or I look at the order from and go, where are the measurements? Well, we really didn't need them. I, I you know, I, we'll get them at the time when we're ready to, you know, order. Really? How many times have you taken measurements or a piece of equipment or a chair has been ordered and it comes in, you go to dispense it and it's like, whoa, it's not even close. Now, the wise therapist or sales rep has taken numbers and taken all the measurements at the very start and dated it. Because how many times have you gone back and it took what, six months to get a funding, eight months to get funding? Well, with children, you feed them, you water them, they grow. 
or we put them in the chair and say, it doesn't really look right. Oh yeah, I gained 50 pounds. Well, yeah, it's not gonna fit. And we go back and compare those measurements or to be able to go back to a funding source and say, yeah, it's been two years. We'd like to replace the equipment. They've grown and they deny it. Well, and you go, well, but they've grown. And the funding source says, well, we can't tell you what we want to hear, but you know, some objective numbers would help. Well, they've grown six inches in height. So what does that mean? Did they grow six inches in upper leg length? Did they grow six inches in trunk? Is it spread out over? So having the numbers and knowing what you're measuring for is really helpful. You want to figure out where you're going to measure them. And we're going to touch on that one. And how are you going to measure? If you are a single therapist working in the community and you're trying to take measurements on your own and you need about eight hands to help that person set up, what's your plan for getting accurate measurements? Have you got the resources available? Taking measurements is not an exercise in goniometry. Let's be very clear about that. There's, there's books that are written about describing and measuring and how we describe a scoliosis and everything else. I'm not talking about somebody's range of motion. Absolutely. Measurements are part of a much bigger picture for the assessment for equipment. A comprehensive assessment involves a mat assessment. Absolutely. And evaluating of where the equipment's going to be used and who's going to use it and where it's going to get used and what's our purpose and our goals and everything else and, you know, skin health and pain and wounds and history of skin breakdown or anything like that. The measurements are not goniometry. Okay. They're to be able to set a, a parameters to be able to say, what are we ordering and what sizes and why? I realized I was an OT to my core when I was in a home improvement warehouse type store and I needed something. And I don't know, however, we got discussing with the sales rep and I reached into my pocket and I pulled out my measuring tape. And he looked at me and I go, well, don't you have one? You work here. How many therapists are in the room? How many sales reps? I should say how many others now, okay. How many people have a measuring tape in their pocket every day? How many women have a measuring tape that they always have in their purse? And when your spouse says, well, that looks like to be about, I said, wait a minute. <laughs> when we're measuring for equipment, there is a lot of tools that are out there. Okay, absolutely. I, you know, my trusty measuring tape, but I got to tell you, it's the smallest one because it fits in my pocket and fits in my purse because I don't want to carry a suitcase. When we were working with clients with, well, they're quite infectious actually. How many times have I used the IKEA tape? Because I could throw it out because this is a bit of an infection control nightmare. How many people like having the calipers with them? Because you know something, you get a really nice straight measure. How portable are they to fit in your purse or your pocket? This is the one in the tool bag. And I love this one, because guess what? If I start to bend, Ah, I don't have a straight line. This is the one that I encourage therapists to, to use or sales reps to always use because this is the one that tells you when you're messing up. Okay. Wait, it's a measurement too. Clients that live in a long-term care facility, clients that you're seeing in clinics, clients that maybe are in a hospital, have access to some kind of a scale, we hope. How many people work in the community? How do you get your clients measured? How accurate are they? There you go. I challenge, have challenged and continue to push 
our senior managements to say, how is it that we don't have a way to measure our clients? Particularly, we're selling them a power chair or a scooter that has a weight capacity of what? 250 pounds? And we're asking the client to self judge how heavy they are? Oh, yeah, I weighed about, I don't know, 230 last time I was in the hospital. How long ago was that? Oh, about five years ago. Do your pants fit the same? Not really. There are, there are scales that actually can go on ceiling lifts. There's lots of other ways. In the worst case scenario, what do, and how is this dignity for our clients? Okay, <laughs> you know where they have the scale at that place to measure the big laundry bins? I need you to go drive on it, okay? And then come and then transfer out and have somebody bring your chair back. I actually had somebody else, the way they used to get the client's weight, is they went to the scrap dealer and drove the chair onto the scale. Of course, the client was over 400 pounds and we really did need to have an accurate weight. How else do we have clients getting weights? We have clients saying, I go to Princess Auto. I don't know, they have that in the States? Okay. They go, I get a, I get a meat scale. I go, what do you mean a meat scale? Okay, and then I go, oh, yeah. Uh, like hunters use when they get the deer and they hang it. I said, on the other hand, you know, the group home uses that and they have a, it's a, it, the same purse, same scale used for one person every time. So it is actually kind of accurate. It's better than nothing and guessing and going, he looks about 250. Okay. Remember, weight is a measure. And it is something we want to track over time as well because they may have gained. Yeah. Well, he grew, he got bigger. Well, how much? Telling that the funding agency he gained 50 pounds as opposed to five pounds may make a big difference in them approving a, a change in function or a new piece of equipment. We're going to talk about measurement for sitting. There's lots of other measures for standers and, and, and walkers and everything. We're not going to touch on that. But life is more than just a cushion. So when we talk about sitting, Measuring for sitting is not just for a cushion or a wheelchair. It's about toileting, it's about bathing, it's about transportation, maybe in a car seat or a bath seat, or even measuring for a sling. So saying I'm only going to take the measurements, well, I only really need his hips and his legs. Really? Because there's lots of other places that people sit and there's lots of other measures that we need to be able to order things and prescribe things correctly. How do we, or where do we do the, the assessment? the mat assessment and take the measurements, okay? In a perfect world, gosh, wouldn't I love to have a plinth with me all the time. I already carry enough equipment, please. We can take measurements in a lot of different environments and on a lot of different surfaces. These are all the ones that I've actually assessed and measured people on, but you have to take things into consideration. When I'm gonna measure somebody on the bed, I know that I'm going to have to make sure my hand is in their lowest posi possible position because they're sinking into the surface. Same with the couch, same with maybe an office chair. We certainly have put sat people on coffee tables. So we have a, a, a firm surface or some uh, one client said, here, I'll just hop up on the table for you because it's a nice flat surface. I had somebody else who was like, well, we're going to see him in bed. He's on a low air loss surface. I said, well, this is going to be a challenge. And he goes, he turns to his daughter, goes, Okay, you know that piece of plywood I have in the garage, we're just going to put a blanket on and we'll put it in. It's like, what? But it's possible just as long as you recognize where you're going to, where the issues are going to arise from it and where you're going to have to make some corrections. Our goal for seating, anytime we are assessing for seating and mobility or a piece of equipment or our, our goals for posture, we are trying to achieve the most neutral midline posture that person can achieve or sustain for the length of time they need to be in that device. Which means we want to measure them in their best corrected posture. Now, we have physios in the room, right? I'm going to pick on you just for a minute. 
in my experience, it's usually the physio who says, wait a minute, let me do the stretching for 45 minutes before we do the custom seating, before we do the measurements, because I can get some real good trunk elongation. And I look at them and I go, that's really nice, excellent for you. But how often do you think this person is going to be stretched for 45 minutes for, by their care staff before they get them in the chair? So when I say the person's best corrected posture, and you can see, depending on whether somebody's sitting in a forward lumbar lordosis, whether sitting in a posterior pelvic tilt, or whether we have them in a neutral alignment, it makes a difference in the measurements that we're going to get. But the more important part is to also say, what is the best corrected posture that this person will be able to achieve or sustain in their seating system, as opposed to 45 minutes of stretching and eight people holding them. There are lots of measurements for people. There's lots of, 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 of assessment tools that give you a whole list of things that you should be measuring. And you go, well, that's, a, that's an awful lot of numbers to have to measure. And that's what I have been told by a couple of sales reps. when they said, well, I'm not measuring from filling in all those boxes. I go, okay, let's actually take a look and see how these numbers and where are they, why do we need them? Because we can really take that list and start to break it down about how the, what they relate to and what we're looking for. If somebody's not going to want to do all the measurements, they better at least get the measurements for the device that they're looking at. And when we look at those numbers, we need to make sure when we're measuring that we're getting the numbers in the right order. I, on occasion, actually teach at a, at a community college level where they're actually for the OTA and PTA assistant programs. So they're pretty green um, and I'll, you know, my, my test for them always is, what are the three most important numbers that we're looking at when we're prescribing a, a wheelchair? And they can sort of come up with, well, a seat width and a seat depth, and with some prodding, we can get a seat height. And I go, but here's the corollary part, the second part. This is question B of the, of the test is in the right order. Because every now and then I get somebody saying, yeah, I'm looking for um, a, tw a 20 by 16 cushion for the client. I go, really? Are you sure? Well, yeah. Uh, I said, which number's which? And people are giving it by, you know, depth by width. I said, that's a very different product than the, what we need. He, he needs a 16 by 20 super low. And if you think about when you ask your manufacturer, what, what size does a cushion come in? And they'll tell you, well, it's, you know, we've got 16 by 16 and 16 by 18 and 16 by 20 and, you know, 18 by 18 and 18 by 16 and 8 by 20. And remember, that's the order they're putting it in. And when you ask the manufacturer of a wheelchair, what sizes do they have? That's the order they're giving it in. So we have to definitely reinforce that with people we're working with that says, this is the numbers and these are the orders that we, that this is the order of numbers that we actually want it. So there's our measurement man again. And I added a black box called function. Because really, the six items that are listed there are very much the items that get requested usually on, at least in, in a, a couple of uh, funding organizations that we work with, the funding application. That's kind of where I pulled them from. But they're very, very common numbers to say, what are you aiming for for this client, for the prescription? where they ask usually want seat width, a seat depth, a finished seat to floor height, a finished back height, a back cane height, and maybe a finished leg length. Okay. So really, how do we get those numbers? And that's really what we're gonna actually use when we now look at the different segments. So if we start with hip width, if it's saying hip width is a bit of a, a misnomer because really we, we're not looking at hip width so much, actually we're looking at a seated width. Because when we say hip width, that means we're only measuring at the person's hips. When really, if I think about a seated width, it's not necessarily a hip width. We're somehow measuring and want to know what the widest point of somebody's seated position is. 
And that widest point is not necessarily the hips. Maybe it's actually the lateral surfaces of their knees. Now, does that mean that if we have the widest point at the knees, if this, if the hips measured 16 and at the knees measured 20, should we be automatically looking at a 20 inch wide chair for that individual? Not necessarily. Because the minute we are going to a larger chair, we're taking in thinking about environment and a 16 inch chair versus a 20 inch chair is pretty different for accessing home and getting through doorways and, and, and maneuvering. Maybe we're looking at it and saying from a functional perspective, you know something, maybe we could actually work with an 18 inch wide chair and we're going to take the transfer loops off the front of the armrests. Or maybe we can actually look at the frame of the chair at saying keeping it 16 because I actually want to keep the armrest in kind of close and i'm going to you know flare the cushion out and i'm going to let it overhang at the front because i'm keeping it within the frame of the chair. So that's where it gets back and says we take the measurements we're going to measure and, and maybe make another note that says our hips are this but knees are out to here. And then run it through function and say hmm. How's that going to affect the prescription? And this is where our friend comes in because the risk of using the soft guy, as I said, no woman wants to have four inches added to her hips. So we want to make sure that we're always doing a straight line measurement. And how do we achieve that? Well, if you've measured enough people, sometimes we're pretty good at being able to, you know, tuck a hand in and figure out where the hand is going to be and tuck it in. That's very nice. Maybe we have the calipers and we could just tuck them in really nicely. I realized I was dating myself. I, I, I do say, you know, pick a, pick a, pull the clipboards or the books. I realized I was dating myself the one time when I turned and I said, well, yeah, we just grabbed the, the you got any VHS tapes, boxes that we'll put in? And it's like, oh, and then I thought, well, we'll upgrade it. Well, you, you just pull out the DVD boxes and it's like, oh, no, can't use those anymore either. Apparently a USB stick is just not big enough. Uh, but again, we're, you're looking and saying, how can I get the most accurate measurement? And when we're measuring, here's the really nice part about using your hands is part of that assessment is saying, hmm, yeah, if I allow tissue to, or well, tissue or pelvic packaging, as we would like to call it, if I just let it to flow, ooh, that's a 22 inch wide chair. But with my hands, I can tell the quality of tissue. Is it a is it a hard yep it's 22 wide or maybe you know a little less or do we have what we call squishable tissue can I contain them a little bit. And I can feel that with my hands before i'm going to find that with calipers where i'm just kind of going where the tissue is so again taking the measurements yeah we're looking for an objective number. But it also becomes part of that assessment to say can we actually contain them more to increase their access of their environment, or as one lady said, she goes, whoa, do that again, I just got higher. And, and she said, she says, you know, some, I'll take any height I can. She was, she was, it was quite short in stature, and she goes, when I have to sit at the band council table, she says, I'm short. She says, I need all the help I can. She goes, we're going with a narrower chair, we're going to actually really get me in so I can actually whoosh, come up the ear. Like, okay, hey. But it also is an opportunity to give people the, to, to be able to say how they're going to need to use their chair as well, because do the measurements reflect real life? What else is going into that chair? The lady said, I always have my purse at my side. That's fine. She only, she was a little wee lady. She's in a massive chair. Can we put her in something small? She goes, well, but my purse won't fit. Well, we'll put it on the back. Well, I can't reach it there. So do the measurements, the measurements of the person, do they reflect in the prescription? Or have you taken all the other pieces into account as well? So it gets back to that diagram that says, okay, so our seat width, it's the measurement of the person 
and their function. So we're really, we might be looking at the widest point of the lower extremities and maybe some seating. I look at some of my active users, guy measures 14 at his hips. And I go, give you a little bit of wiggle room. He goes, nope, I wanna be in there. And it, we're, we're like, we're getting a 13 inch chair because the clothing guards are on the outside of the frame and he wants to be in. Or maybe I'm looking and saying, we have to do some custom seating. We're gonna have some adductors. We're gonna have an inch on either side. So I'm taking the measurement and I know the manufacturer, I'm gonna have an inch of seating on either side. But on the other hand, I know the manufacturer of the chair and you know, they, they got a block that's actually gonna be mounting the armrest. And I, I can guarantee I got a 14 inch chair. I got 15 between the arms. So it, we're taking that all into consideration when we're taking that number in. Let's talk about that upper leg length or the seat depth, okay? Same thing, we're looking for best corrected posture because, and what are you actually measuring? Are you measuring from the back of where they're gonna touch with their backrest because he's sitting in a slump or are we actually just measuring where his butt will no longer touch the cushion? And that could be inches of difference depending on how the person is sitting. And I think this is probably one of the measures where I see the most issues, cushion depth and posture. Because if we actually order the cushion based on a slump posture or took the measurement, and this is the best corrected posture, there's no way the person is ever gonna get all the way back on the cushion to touch the backrest. And then the comment is, well, he's always sliding. Well, yeah, because he can't get all the way back on the cushion because the cushion is too long. So we're never gonna get good posture because we've ordered a cushion. He's sitting on the front edge of the well. No kidding, he's uncomfortable. And the same thing comes down to cushion depth and function. How is the person going to use that chair? Do we want the cushion to be all the way to the back of the calf? Or do we actually have to have a gap because the person is foot propelling? And if we don't give him that gap of the shorter cushion, he's always gonna be sliding forward. We see that for foot propelling, absolutely. Because in order to have good heel strike and follow through, we need to have, we, or we want to have a gap between there. Otherwise, the person is going to scoot themselves forward. If they're hitting the front and uncomfortable, people are very good about enabling their own function. They just might not sit how we want them to. But is that their issue or is that ours because we didn't set them up for success in the first place? We talk about the rule of fingers. When I actually teach caregivers about how to get somebody in the chair and how do I know if he's incorrectly, I said, it's fingers. I want the thickness of a hand between the front edge of the cushion and the back of the calf for somebody who is totally dependent, where their feet are sitting on the footrest. I want the, thick, the thickness of the hand going this way. On the other hand, if somebody's foot propelling, I want the thickness of the hand going the other way, because I want to have three inches at least behind, between the back of their calf and the front of the cushion. So when they do heel strike and they come through, they're not hitting the cushion. We've actually got room to be able to do it. Now, I show four fingers because I know my four fingers are three inches. Everybody's hand is different. How much is your hand? How, how, how far are your fingers versus yours? So you, you, know, you need to have your thumb in there for three fingers for, for three inches. But that's one of the ways because do I wanna be pulling a measuring tape out every time we're assessing somebody? Oh my gosh, we got him in the chair as he sit. Let me get the measuring tape and see if I got exactly an inch. No, I wanna be able to just go, oh, let's, let's put a hand. He's doing pretty good. We, got, we have a nice gap in there. So that's a little bit of using yourself and, and knowing what your measurements are and how to make it so it's not intimidating as well. So when I actually put those numbers and say, huh, how does that affect for seat depth when I actually wanna do my prescription details? Well, my seat depth is determined by perhaps the upper leg and minus one inch. 
to give me my seat depth that I'm aiming for. Or maybe it's the upper leg length minus three inches because a person foot propels. So it's not just a matter of saying, ah, oh, the client measures this much, that's the cushion. We have to take those measurements and put it through how the person is actually going to use that chair or how, what, their, what the box of function is. Lower leg length. Same idea. What are the influences? Well, we better have marked down when we took their lower leg length because we're going again. We're tucking a finger up behind in their popliteal fossa and measuring to the floor. But did you make a note whether they had their AFOs on? Did you make a note that it was wintertime and they had their heavy winter boots on? Or was it summertime and she had little ballerina flats on? Did you ask, is this the regular shoe that you wear? Because it makes a pretty big difference. It can make an inch or two of difference. So we want to make sure when we're taking the measurements that we're also making a note what they were wearing at the time. And what do the measurements mean for the wheelchair? So if I actually take a look at this diagram, there are three descriptors here that unfortunately get used interchangeably. We need to be very, very clear when we're working about what we are actually asking for or what we are describing. The lower leg length is the person's measurement. And it's going to be, for example, in this case, it's going to be from the top of the cushion to the foot plate for somebody who uses a foot plate, who uses foot, a foot support. The front seat to floor height really is from the top of the rail of the chair to the floor. A finished seat to floor height, on the other hand, is the difference from the top of the cushion to the floor. Hmm, okay. So when I go back to that list and how the person actually sits or what we're running through for function, how's that gonna change what those numbers are? Because realistically, if you're a therapist, you're measuring that lower leg length. If you're a sales rep, what number do you really want to know? You want to know a seat to front, a front seat to floor for ordering a chair, because that's how you configure a wheelchair. But you always want to know what the finished seat to floor had as well is, because now you're looking at, oh, which chair are we looking at? And what wheel caster and, 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 and axle and, and stem combination am I putting to get that? Because I also need to know what cushion they're going on and how thick it's going to be at the front. And just to throw a monkey wrench into it, just to make it more interesting, is what happens for the person who requires two different finished seat to floor heights because they foot propel with only one foot. So now we need, we've got one functional leg where we want to have the seat to floor height where they can get foot on the floor and move. And I have to have a dependent leg that's actually going to be up on a foot plate. So maybe there's a left and a right, and I need to figure out how I'm going to manage that. Am I lowering a cushion on the one side, or am I wedging up on the other? Now, for foot propelling, the other little wrinkle we have in there is that measurement. Let me go back one. If somebody's foot propelling, that lower leg length, we usually think should be pretty close to this. And that's what I often see. Realistically, if somebody's foot propelling, I want their lower leg length and finished seat to floor height to be very close. I actually want the finished seat to floor height to be one inch less than their lower leg length. Otherwise, if I just make it that it's equal, and they can sit and their feet just nicely rest on the floor and they go to propel the chair, what happens? It'll be Freddie Flintstone. They're not getting anywhere. On the other hand, if I make that finished seat to floor height one inch less than their lower leg length, now they can actually get a foot on it and they can get good grip and they can now propel that chair forward because they can exert a force on the floor to be able to get grip to move the chair forward. If on the other hand, somebody does a standing pivot transfer to get into the chair. I need to get as low a seat to floor height as I can for them. Pretty much my finished seat to floor height is going to be the, in most cases, or where I'm going to start, 
is her lower leg length plus three inches. You go, three inches? How do you get that number? Well, me and my little measuring tape have discovered that most wheelchairs, the mounting hardware of the foot plate and the tube that goes underneath is about one inch. And generally speaking, we want to have about two inches of clearance underneath that lowest point and the ground. So they're not shoveling gravel every time they're out in the community or catching on lips. So now we start to look and say, huh, okay. So now I run those numbers and put them on my little chart. What does that mean? Well, for somebody who's foot propelling, my finish seat to floor height is going to be the lower leg length minus that inch. So I got some grip. Somebody who's doing a stand pivot transfer, I want their lower leg length and I'm going to add three inches. That's kind of the lowest I can get them. Huh. But there's also the one that says lower leg length plus what? Well, maybe somebody who's using a footrest. Maybe somebody is, and they're totally dependent. Do I really care how low they are? Maybe their lower leg length isn't the important number at that point. Maybe more important for finished seat to floor height is I'm determining it by saying, well, do they need to get under a table or under a desk? And a more important measurement instead of the lower leg length is what's the distance that I have to maintain the top of their thigh to floor height? I have to keep it under a certain amount so they can fit under a desk or fit under a table. Or maybe I have other restrictions. Maybe I'm finish, figuring my finished seat to floor height or my finished leg, reg, less, leg rest length because I need to keep them low so they can actually, the floor lift can actually lift them off the wheelchair. Or maybe it's a different height for transfers, getting in and out of a vehicle, getting on and off a, another chair or a bed or anything else. Let's talk about back height. I've listed three things or three aspects that we can actually measure there. PSIS, of course, your superior lax spine, bottom of scapula, top of shoulder. Those are kind of ones that are fairly common. There is a couple others that we can add on to that. But let's have a chat about why those particular ones might be important. Because really, when we're talking about back height, there's two different numbers that we're looking at. We're either looking at back height as in what's the height of the actual backrest versus what's the finished or what's the where do i want that backrest to rest relative on that chair because this is the same size backrest why do we worry about where the psis is because really what's the purpose of that backrest we actually want to prevent somebody from falling into posterior pelvic tilt how can we achieve that one of the ways is by blocking at PSIS so they actually don't fall into a posterior pelvic tilt. So I kind of want to know where the PSIS is, and then I'm looking and saying, huh, where do I need that back to end? Because if I actually put the backrest too high, if I have a fixed back height and I put it too high, I'm not blocking the PSIS, they're falling into pelvic, posterior pelvic tilt, they're sliding, the, the cushion will get blamed, and it wasn't the cushion's issue. Or maybe I've actually put it too too low i've actually because i didn't pick the correct back height i'm blocking the psis but they can arch all the way over the backrest and again it goes back to the numbers did we measure them correctly in the first place that's why when i start to look and say what are the other things we should be measuring or why well we usually are looking and saying i i need a low back height for somebody who's really active in a chair Maybe I'm actually putting it to the bottom of the scapula for somebody who's propelling, and I want to ensure whatever that finished back height is below their scapula so they're not irritating. Maybe I'm actually putting it somewhere around the top of that scapula because that's where their back starts to pull away from the backrest, and I really don't need a backrest all the way up here. I'm making them sit on a throne when I do that. Or maybe I need to make sure that the backrest actually goes to the top of the shoulder because we have a shoulder harness and I need to make sure we have the right angle of pull on their chest support or their anterior trunk support. And any time we're measuring trunk, we really need to be aware of what's their corrected 
or their best corrected posture, or are we measuring them in their slump posture, that that's just kind of how they sit, but I actually want to get them to here. So have I corrected it, and I've achieved the goal that I intend to do with the seating and taken the measurements then? Because sliding is not always a cushion issue. Sometimes it's actually related to the back. So what do the measurements mean for the chair? Well, and this is where we also have to be kind of careful. Back cane height depends when we're looking at chairs. We actually have to be careful about how the manufacturer measures it. Do they measure it from the floor or do they measure it from the seat rail? Because that relationship between a back height, which is the height of the backrest itself, is different than the number of a finished back height. Back height is only the backrest. A finished back height takes into a couple of things. Do we want to have a gap between the backrest and the cushion? And how thick is that cushion? So if I actually now take it back to our little measurement men, and maybe our back height is also required, is related to somebody's functional arm movements. Do they need to be able to reach over to get into a bag or to be able to brace themselves or to be able to hook around a back cane that's there? So if I actually take a look and relate it to our little man again, maybe our back cane height or our, our finished back height, we're looking at maybe just to the top of the pelvis and two inches. You go, why two inches? Hmm. Well, a lot of factory minimums, when you look at a cushion, you say, well, the cushion's three inches. Yeah, but it also compresses down. Is a factory standard for custom seating. They say we want to have an inch and a half to two inches of material as at the lowest bony prominence of that cushion. If you look at a rojo, what's the minimum air distance that the person is actually going to sink in when they're on that cushion? I say two inches because when we actually took a lot of cushions in the back at the shop and, and sat on them and compared how much we actually sat, sank down, it really didn't matter a lot which cushion it was. In most cases, we had about two inches of material underneath the individual. So again, it gets back to that whole idea. Our finished back height, where I want that backrest to end, may be I'm taking my measurement from the top of the pelvis and adding two inches. Okay? Or maybe I'm taking and saying, what's my measurement of the person from the bottom of the scapula? And I add my two inches on for somebody who arm propels. Or maybe I'm saying, what's their measurement from the top of the shoulder? And add two inches on because you need a back height that's actually going to allow shoulder straps to go across. Back cane height, though, how are we measuring that? Are we using it for the user because that's where they're going to use it to hook? Or are we asking what's the back cane height for the carer who's pushing? And of course, when that number is specific, you know that dad is 6'4 and mom's 5'1. Or are we picking the back cane height to be able to mount the seating on the chair? And we have to have X number of inches to be able to fit the hardware on or top, cane, top clamps and bottom clamps. And we're actually picking back cane height, not based on user requirements, but on their seating in order that it can be safely mounted. And we have other measurements that we look at for secondary supports. Shoulder widths, chest widths, chest depth. I'm putting a lateral on, it sure is nice to know how, how deep that lateral has to be so I don't have them too short or way too long. We also, perhaps may are also looking at uh, head measurements. For example, the head width to fit in the cradle of a head support. Or I want to know the, the seat to the top of the head because I actually want to be able to mount the equipment and have everything set up um, in, in, in when I take stuff out for fitting. Or maybe the person says, well, <laughs> I need him to fit into the, the doorway or the frame of, to get in the, in the vehicle. And it sure is nice to know what the measurements are because we've had, certainly had families where we said, listen, <laughs> I know that's what you said the measurement is, but let's just take the measuring tape. He measures this much. I can't shorten him. He's got lower leg of this much. Even if I dump him and bend him, I can't get him down that low. So is that, a, is that the wheelchair issue? Is that the frame? Or are we actually starting to look and say, we have to make some compromises here? Because those are the measurements that we start to look at when we're looking at a seating system and ordering the components. 
And the more numbers and more information that I can get to the builders in the back, we give them the numbers. They can set stuff up beforehand because, gosh, it's really nice to be able to take the chair out and say, let's put them in. And our fitting goes, put them in, and we're just doing little tweaks instead of saying, oh, my gosh, I've got to move the laterals up, and I've got to move them out, and we, oh, we drop the bolts, and we can't move this, and is there interfering with that? The more information that we can give and have up front is better for our, when we're actually trying to justify change or trying to make things go quicker and smoother at a dispense. Our time is valuable. The other measurements we might be looking at are elbow height. And again, we're looking at it from a seated posture. We're looking and saying at a best corrected posture, maybe we're looking at it because we're looking at a tray height or an armrest height. We may look at a forearm length because we're looking at, um, again, we're looking at what the arm support is going to be. Maybe we need to know how far out that joystick has to sit. Or are we going to have an elbow rubbing on the wheel? Also, other measurements certainly are when we're looking at foot measurements. How long is the foot? How wide are the feet? Are there shoes on or boots on or anything else? Or because we actually need to know, we're going to actually do a taper on a, on a front end of a chair. Will their feet fit in there? I'm looking at a foot box. Can we actually fit the foot box between the canes and fit the feet in it, for example? Lost it. We're there? So, okay. So, when we actually look at our measurement man, function onto it, <laughs> and then we actually are slowly building up and slowly build it up that we're actually looking. Oh, it's going to get interesting now. Now I have one hand, I'm only one armed. This is going to be tough. We've taken our measurements from our measurement man. We've run them through function. And it starts to build up what our prescription details are. Because the numbers are just numbers if we use them in isolation. We need to look at how function is applied to it. Now, there's a few other little, you know, reality sinks in when we're taking measurements in supine. And we're going to bring somebody up into standing, we're going to bring somebody up into sitting. We have to factor in gravity. Because when somebody lies down. Hello? Okay. <laughs> Our seat depth, when we bring somebody from lying and we bring them into sitting. I know that upper, that seat depth, upper leg length is going to get longer. Guess what? This squishes out the back. It gets longer. When I do lower leg length, I know that'll get longer. Because guess what? When I sit, I'm compressing the tissue of the thigh. So that's going to actually get become longer. Armpit height is going to get shorter, whether the person is lying down or I bring them up into sitting because gravity wants to compress the spine. And the same thing with a back height. I know gravity is going to actually affect the measurements that I took when the person was in supine. And last but not least, for somebody who's going to have a change in position and space when they're sitting. I know that if I sit them up and I set everything and I set a backrest height or I set a headrest position, and now they're actually going to have dynamic tilt in their system. Their measurements are going to change because gravity is now acting to help elongate. So we have to take that into consideration. Maybe our backrest height becomes longer or become a taller backrest height. So I know that, for example, they're really, I really need to support behind the shoulders when they tilt back. So again, it gets back to how is the person going to function once they're in their device. And we have additional measurements for bariatrics. Um, I, this would be a whole different topic. but. Some of the things that we actually start to look at is maybe, and, and I had a lo lovely experience with a gentleman. He was 750 pounds, 
and he was in the hospital bed. And they said, can you come and help us figure out what chair we're going to put him in? I went, that's great. I met the guy. And he goes, I said, ooh, 750, okay. He says, yeah, but I wasn't that when I came in. I said, where were you when you came in? I was only 650. I said, okay. I guess it's a little smaller chair if you can get back to that. Um, but what was interesting is we measured him. And the most telling one was, I think we were 36 inches at his knees, but because of how his legs sat and his toes were out, the most important measurement ended up being his toe width. He was 54 inches from toe to toe. And I said, you know something, that's lovely that we could, we could get you a chair, but you're never getting through any doorway like that. So we, anyway, it, it ended up a whole other discussion. But that whole idea of what are the critical measurements that you need? And then more importantly, quite often with bariatrics, is we're looking at a gluteal shelf and trying to determine how much that is. And, and then what are the strategies of how are we going to bring a backrest that close to the individual? Because if we just take it that it would be ease sort of their seat pen depth, we'd never have them even coming close to touching the backrest. And last but not least, don't forget you've got a right and a left side. And I know some funding agencies don't want to know that. Because when we tell them there's a different measurement from one side to the other, or we need something, a different armrest on one side versus the other, they get all kind of squirrely about that. But remember, when you're measuring, don't forget, it's going to be different from one side to the other, or could be. There's a lot of different manufacturers order forms out there. This is just a very small selection of three that I came across when they were showing all kinds of different measurements. And yeah, no kidding. There's some that they're showing, they're asking for the width of, you know, a left foot versus a right foot. There's lots of other measurements on there. So again, depending on what device you're looking at and what measurements you're gonna have to be looking at that, that didn't even look, didn't even show up on Mr. Measurement Man that I showed you. At the end of the day, measurements, the whole, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Getting somebody's measurements, adding in how they're going to use the device, what their skin health is like, what their tone is like, who the caregivers are, what base it's going on to, what environment it's getting used in, who the caregivers are going to be, are they technology tolerant or intolerant? How is it going to get used? How many people? What, where is it? Is it going to school? Is it going to work? Is it in long-term care? Is there a rotating cast of characters in there? Measurements are just one part of that puzzle. But it's a pretty important one. Getting the size right means a world of difference. I go into long-term care every now and then. Actually, I go in a lot. And I get really tired of hearing well, we need to get a, Mrs. Smith a new chair. And the family goes, oh, we don't need a new chair. We got my ex-wife's mother's cousin's dead brother's chair. I go, really? Yeah. He was about 6'2", about 350 pounds. I said, and your mom is what? Five foot two, 85 pounds soaking wet? I said, you wouldn't ask your son, your child, to wear a size 8 shoe when really he's a size 10. And I wouldn't ask you to squeeze your big foot into a smaller one. So why are we doing that with our loved one? It makes a big difference. We need to get the size right, and we need to make sure we're getting the measurements to get the size right in the first place. And that's it. Ooh. And I got it in under time, too. <laughs> Questions? Oh, hang on, hang on. I'm supposed to tell you. If you don't say it into the microphone, it doesn't exist. Kind of like documentation. <laughs> if, it didn't ha if it didn't get written down, it didn't happen. Yes, at the back. No, no, here's the problem, is that if you don't say it, it doesn't get picked up on the recording.
So oh, be careful uh, what you say. D gotcha. Did you still want to ask your question? Yeah. All right. Um, this is a great presentation. It's very uh, informative. Are you going to upload it into the system? Yeah, here's the issue that I ran into. Just a little story. This is probably the last ISS that I present to after 35 years. Um, I was away for about three weeks with my husband overseas. And uh, I, when I put in to say, do the presentation, I thought, ah, I, I already have one in the bag. I'm pretty sure it's all good. I'll just do that one because, you know, life gets busy. And then I got back and I went and I, or we came back and said, I, I just need to download my brain and not to think about anything while I'm away. And I came back and I went, ooh, <laughs> need a little bit more work to make this one interesting. <laughs> so yes, there was the, we, had, we were supposed to have it in last week as a deadline and that wasn't going to happen. So I will see about getting it uploaded. Yeah, um, because the little measurement man with the box with the function and the arrows, that's probably the one you want. <laughs> Um, here's the other thing you can do. You can write me and I'll send it to you. That's it. I'll send you a PDF. So if I can't get it uploaded, because I'm not that technology tolerant, um, I can always send it to you. Okay. Uh, another question. Yeah. You're getting your work out. <laughs> Vanna is bringing the mic. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you touched on the bariatrics and I'm from Wisconsin and we have a lot of bariatrics and you touched on the backrest versus the seat and the the fitting in the gluteal shelf and the complaint I get from my ladies is always well you put the backrest too high and my butt hangs out the back how do you how do you how do so, you balance it so yeah so there's two ways that I look at that because sometimes when we actually don't put a back there the person also wants to slide back in the chair and then they really get caught at their popliteal fossa as well. So there's two ways of doing it. If it's just a matter of saying, I don't want my butt hanging out because I don't want anybody looking at it. No kidding, we don't want to see it either. But so then it's a matter, is it a privacy flap that goes around? So now I've actually stopped wind and everything else and, and I've covered that area for, and it's a dignity panel. I, I, I joke about it, but it, it truly is. We probably should be considering it more often for people. Um, the other way is that you end up looking at, you recognize that there is that issue and you end up picking a back that is truly designed that has like, it's a, almost like a biangular back that kind of captures it. Or in some case, my passion, what I probably do the most of and get called in is about custom seating is sometimes we build that in, but we recognize that it's an issue. Or is it a matter that you're going to actually have almost like a, a two-piece back that I don't want them to slide back I need to provide a block back there but I recognize I have to have something built forward am I doing sort of two pieces am I doing something where there's that I that I've built that in yeah the bigger issue that I see is people don't recognize that there's a differential and, and it could be four or five inches or more <laughs> 